Good evening, DPF land. Welcome to season two, episode six. We're calling it And So It Begins. So uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I think it's episode eight. eight. What did I say? Six. Episode eight. My apologies. Season two, episode eight. <laughs> and so it begins. Um, it's early, Mike. It's early. It's okay. Yeah. Well, I, did, I took a nap too. So we'll be fine. I'm, I'm still waking up. <laughs> Hey guys, just remember, you can see it at the bottom of the screen there, but for all your internet sound security, TV installation, intercom access um, needs, just remember Pensive Technology, uh, DPF on tap brought to you by Pensive Technology. It's at pensivetechnology.com. Check them out today for all those needs. Hey guys, listen, you also need a whole bunch of stuff, right? You need things that say DPF. If you check out our Facebook page and you hit the shop now button, you can find things like the tumbler that Dugan has, uh, the fanny pack, very uh, fancy fanny pack that I'll be carrying around Albuquerque next week. Um, the shirts, t- uh, sweatshirts, T-shirts. Um, we even have hats now, uh, both the beanie and the uh, baseball hats. So check us out on our Facebook page under the shop now button. Um. And then uh, really uh, had a had a blast this past weekend um, with No Fly Zone, and we're looking forward to DPF uh, group night on May 18th at Citizens Bank Park. Again, uh, we are partnering with No Fly Zone. Remember, fifty dollars all you can eat and drink um, in the uh, par- parking lot. N. There's also a designated driver option for thirty dollars all you can eat sodas and waters. And um, just remember that we are somewhere in the vicinity of 420 tickets currently. And if we get to 500, um, we get Chris to throw out the first pitch, which is huge. I found out something last week that if we get to 1,000, then Dugan can go with them. If we get to 1,500, then John can go with them. And if we get to 2,000, then I can join them. So let's not stop at 500, but uh, let's get there at least. So looking forward to May 18th. Uh, Also remember on our Facebook uh, shop now button, we were just talking about, we have our salute to service t-shirts. We are partnering that day is salute to service. We are partnering with uh, battle brothers foundation and all the proceeds, 100% of the proceeds of that t-shirt is going to battle brothers foundation. Um, They are currently helping servicemen and women in need uh, that are either uh, former service folks or also current service folks so uh check us out online if you order tickets use the code dpf 2020 and remember hashtag dpf cares guys so we're going to continue here with our um our format that we kicked off last week and we're going to go kind of round robin with some questions but uh i think the first one i want to go to is for everybody. I want to go around the call and I just want to know. So we had that, uh, we had that opening day that got um, moved from Thursday to Friday and we got to talk to a bunch of people in lot K and then we uh, partnered with no fly zone on Saturday um, with their, you know, their maiden voyage with the bus. And so I just kind of want to go around the room and see what your guys favorite part of that weekend was. Um, Chris, you want to start? Yeah. So to me, it's always like being able to see as many DPF people in one spot. Uh, Everyone's kind of like, you know, just cool. We're happy to see each other. We're there for really two reasons, uh, to drink some beers and to root on the fills. Um, So we did both. Uh, The fills didn't help us out, but, you know, the people, (laughs) the people, the people. Cool. Johnny, I'll just go around the horn. Uh, it was uh, heartwarming. Not, uh, I don't want to say overwhelming, but it, it, not overwhelming in a bad way. It was just really nice to be overcome with all the, all the, um, you know, the handshakes and the hellos and, oh, hey, you're John. Hey, you're Dugan. Hey, this. Just talking baseball, like, making, you know, having laughs, whatever, just meeting up with uh, all our followers, like Chris said. Some of my personal Twitter followers that watch this watch the pod and some that haven't yet but now they will because like oh i didn't know you were a part of this i just i was like, oh yeah you got to watch so hopefully we turned on some uh you know new viewers um it was just a blast man 
Hugan? Yeah, I, I mean, I got to agree with these guys. It, it, it's, it's all about meeting the people. I mean, we have some people that we've met at some of these events that have become real close friends at DPF and come to private DPF events and things like that. So it's always fun to meet people and develop those relationships. Um, I, I was pretty much kind of in charge of handing out the, you know, the magnets and the stickers and everything too. I did a lot of that. So uh, just a reaction to people just getting something with our logo and, and uh, seeing how much they enjoyed it and, Oh man, thanks. You know, I'm going to put this on my fridge or, you know, it's going to go on my, the back of my car. Um, you know, and, and to have that support and to, to to see just the general excitement of them to just meet us and talk to us and, and have a good time. It was, it, you know, it was really a lot of fun. Saturday with the bus, I mean, the guys were dan- people dancing and having a good time. And uh, it, it was just, it was a lot of fun. And I can't wait for the 18th. I mean, it's just going to be really crazy. I can't wait. Yeah. I agree with that for sure. Um, I think to add on all that, what you guys said, but to add on, there was on Saturday a group of guys that clearly go to that spot in Lot N all the time. They're roofers. They were cool. I talked to a few of them. And they were, while while no fly zone guys were setting up, they were blaring music. And that is clearly their MO. When DJ Nugget came on, they turned their music off and they started dancing to his music. I thought that was really cool. Um, I also thought that the excitement of like a brand new season, um, some we'll get to it in a little bit, but some new features at the ballpark, there was a little bit of a buzz in the parking lot um, about the team, about the stadium, you know, it's 20 years, uh, that kind of thing. But all, all what you guys said, but those two things kind of stuck out to me. Oh, and, the fact that just out of my cooler, there was 70 beers drank on Friday. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> awesome, That's man. Good That's a good word. <laughs> uh, glad that uh, we got to do that around the horn real quick. But uh, now let's let's get down to some meat and potatoes. I know, uh, I know we've got some things to talk about here. There's <clears throat> um, one or two. Uh, what I'll call positives and uh, you know, we'll have some opportunities uh, that probably outweigh the, the, uh, the positives here, but I'll go to you first, Chris. Um, what do you think, uh, you know, so far in the first six games is topper being too analytical with the, with the lineup? Um, I feel like Topper, you know, I, I don't feel like the Phillies have had a good manager in a really long time. <laughs> I'm going to be completely honest. I think Charlie was decent, but I think, you know, a fucking couch could have, like, done what they needed to do with that team. Charlie gets a lot of credit, but, like, Charlie, you know, wasn't exactly out there making huge changes. Uh, I don't know the last time the Phillies have had a manager that made a difference. Uh, so... In a positive way, um, this guy is doing the same stuff that an other tan dick asshole is doing, except we're giving him a free pass. Um, and he, the analytical part of him, it's just like you know what he's going to do before he even does it. And if I know, and I'm 10 to 12 years deep, the other manager <laughs> knows what the fuck he's going to do. <laughs> three innings before so you know it, it i think it really uh causes some problems as far as what he's doing strategically now maybe he's like emotional intelligence and like can kind of let the boys be the boys and police themselves i think there's an importance to that too um but i'm more of a tortorella um type of manager than you know, this guy who is like, let, let me look at the computer. Let me look at the book. This dude's tan dick without the coconut oil. Yeah. Well, and I think, muscle. I think we, you know, talking about predicting what he's doing, Chris, I think we talked about on Friday and a lot with, with the Braves throwing freed and sale in the second and 13th, we knew Merrifield was playing both games. It was just a matter of was he going to take, which game was Marsh going to sit yeah. and which game stop was yeah. going to sit. You know, you knew what he was going to do. And not to say that I don't, necessarily disagree because I do want to see Wick get some at bats, but I think Marsh and Stock have to be everyday, everyday guys for you. Um, even against tough lefties, they got to play, especially the first three games of the season. I don't, I mm-hmm. think you roll your, you roll your nine out the first three games of the season, you know, and start giving guys days off, 
you know, 25 games in, not 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 the second and third game in, you know, but no we knew sense. what was coming. We knew what was coming, yeah. and it, it's yeah. just the book. The book is the book can tell everybody what to do, you know. Cool. Johnny, after you got to go to a couple of games, right? You've been mm-hmm. talking a lot about it's 20 years at Citizens Bank Park. What are your thoughts on the improvements? And I'll I'll use air quotes that we saw at Citizens Bank Park. Uh, scoreboard terrible. It's more, let's find 10 more fucking companies to advertise. Like, I haven't been to a fucking Chick-fil-A before. You know what I mean? Uh, like, excuse my French. And it's all this out-of-town scoreboard, my ass, too. They show, like, one score at a time. Then it's like, waste management, Chick-fil-A, this and that. Then it's like, oh, well, this guy's war is this. I'm like, I don't give a fuck what Luis Robert's fucking doing. For the Red Sox, tell me who's playing, who's pitching for the other teams, all the games, like the old school version that we had, and let me see who's pitching for each team and what the score is, the actual out-of-town scores. They're putting all the Yo, crazy... fuck Bob Bip, fuck Pop, Bob yeah. Pip, fuck all that bullshit. All that shit, oh. yeah. I couldn't, find, I couldn't find war. a stat that meant anything to me. I couldn't find yeah. a stat that meant anything. Oh, I seen one. I see. I seen a new one, Dugan. It had an X in the beginning, like X Warb. I'm like, what the fuck are we talking about now? What the fuck is X Warb? Like X batting average. Sure, what's his on base percentage? What's his ERA? Yeah. That's all I want to know. You know. The right. out of town part was this big, and it was advertisements. And then the worst part about it is, and someone right before we got on the air, one of my followers on Twitter pointed it out. He, he was at that game yesterday. He's like, I'm trying to find out how many strikes Wheeler has thrown, and I can't fucking find it. You know where it's at? It's at a 300 level on a thing that's maybe about this long. Like, the ball strikes, you know, and total pitch count. That's yeah. a problem, too. You used to be able to see that square dead in the middle you of that thing. You can't find the inning by inning what, who scored exactly. what, what inning. Unless yeah. you're looking at the big scoreboard. You can't see it yeah. anywhere. Like, it's... I mean, what the fuck do we need a fucking scoreboard for? We ain't scoring any runs. <laughs> you might as well put fuck. it up on the big scoreboard. <laughs> yeah. And fuck greens and grains. I just want to say that. Fuck greens and grains. I'm tired of hearing about your fucking soy chicken. All right. You checked both of my boxes. I wanted you to get to, so that's fantastic. <laughs> There were th- literally three guys standing in that line where they highlighted that. That is a shame. Exactly. They should have just grabbed people out of the chicken and beets line and put them in that line. Yeah. You know what? They should put up a sign. Fuck the soy chicken. Soy no bueno. <laughs> All right, Dugan. So, I mean, you could tell by the tone of the first two questions, right? It, yeah. We're a little frustrated with uh, the the beginning of the year, but clearly opening weekend was a disaster, right? Bad hitting. Uh, execution and approach, bad uh, bullpen pitching, bad base running mistakes. So with all the expectations on this team this year, do we need to be worried on April 4th? I'm going to say no, just because of this team's track record of starting slow. And just because it's their track record doesn't mean we have to accept it. Like, And I think that's the frustration part. Like, we don't have to accept it just because they've done it the past two years that it's just a, for, a foregone conclusion that they're going to start slow um, because we heard all spring training about how they wanted to start fast, how they were going to start fast, how they were going to change their approach at the plate, and they were going to make more contact. They're still striking out at the same rate. They're still sit, making the same bonehead mistakes on the bases that they made last year. And, and that's what drives me crazy about the, the people with the it's early, they'll be fine. The issues that were here – in games four, five, six, and seven last year against the Arizona Diamondbacks are still with this team. They still exist. Nothing's changed. When they hit, they're good enough to beat anybody. When they don't hit, they're good enough to you know they're bad enough to get beat by anybody. And and I I I was hoping for a more consistent approach at the plate, putting the ball in play more, generating more runs with just moving runners along. And the sad part is the guy who's been the best at that it's Schwarber, the guy who hit 190 last year, has been the best at putting the bat on the ball so far this season, in my opinion. Uh, he's got he probably got uh, 30% of the singles he had last year. He already has. He did any That's singles fact. last year. He's already got like uh, six singles, you know. Um, you know, so it, 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 you know, guys like uh, you know, guys like Turner and and Stott. I mean, 
you know, I know it's early, but you look at the averages, 217, 211, 222. You know, Marsh, even Marsh, as good as he's hitting, he's struck out eight eight times already. Um, you know, 13 of his outs, eight of them are by strikeout. Like, you have to put the ball in play. You know, Turner hit that little roller the other night, thrown away, and, and that, that opened up an inning for him to score some runs. Like, nothing can happen when you swing and miss. And I thought that was the – the change they were going to make was to be more, you know, put the ball in play approach, cut down with two strikes, which I think Schwarber has done. Um, he has yeah. cut down his swing with two strikes and, and made made a concerted effort to make more contact. Um, even Merrifield, he, he's not getting hits, but he's put together good at bats and he's not striking out. Like he's putting the bat to the ball and, you know, he, he's just not making solid contact a lot of time. But that's what I want to see more of. You know, I, I take a ground ball that moves a guy up a base, you know, and I thought that's the approach they were going to come out with. We didn't see it in spring training, and we're not seeing it in the first two series so far. And 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 you can't score runs. I mean, the only way they score is if someone hits a home run. Well, yeah, all so I, off season, all you heard was, oh, you know what? We're, we just got beat by a small ball team. We're going to put the ball in play more. We're going to get yeah. contact more. We're going to do smarter things. And you're just seeing the same stuff. It's the same story. And – why would we expect it to be different? Oh, because they lied to us and told us that they were really going to try hard at doing that. Okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 I, it's heard, like, we, I heard it's like say, Scooby-Doo. It's like Scooby-Doo. I would have got away with it if it weren't you there, if DP effort. <laughs> and uh, Castellanos, too. Castellanos is like a construction worker whistling at a deaf chick. You're chasing the wrong shit. Stop chasing <laughs> pitches, dude. <laughs> That's pretty good, man. Did you work on that all week? Nice job. Nah, uh, I hear I hear you say <laughs> you're not worried or don't worry, but I I worry. So <sighs> Chris, you can see at the bottom of my screen it says uh two and four. The division is slipping away in quotes. Michael Barkan. So is there any validity to the Michael Barkan statement that the division is slipping away after six games? No, I mean, that's clickbait nonsense. You know, the Marlins haven't won. The Mets haven't won. We're playing the Nationals. We're only out by one and a half game. Uh, I, I, I don't think there's validity to it, but I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I'm worried. Uh, I'm seriously worried. And I'm so worried that I'm going out to Oakland and Las Vegas next week, and I'm going to beg the athletics to come back here. <laughs> um just because I, I just hope they do. Um, and, and I'm worried. So that's how worried I am. I'm going out there. I'm going to talk to someone. They're going to tell me to go fuck myself. But, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a go. Uh, if you, you know, you don't try, you can't get it. Uh, the issue is we think April's easy because we look at the schedule and see it's easy. But the Braves aren't easy, and the Reds are much improved. They're not good, but they're not the Reds that we think that they were a year or two ago. Um, now, when you're going and playing the Nationals and the Pirates, who you know are starting off good, you got to start off April strong. You just got to do it because how many times are we in May and we're five to eight games below 500, and we're like, man, I hope they really start picking up soon. Um, we started off last year. What was it? Oh, and three guys. So, uh, all right. One and five, I think one and five through the first six yeah. or something last year. Okay. So, yeah. you know, if you look at the positive spin, like we're not that shitty yet. Um, it's a little faster. We got off to a faster start than last year. <laughs> yeah. They told us they're, they're going to try to get off to a quick start. Um, but no, I think Barkan, I think that's just, you know, he's, he's aggravated and he just wants to, you know, kind of lash out and, Say say what he feels, but two and four to me isn't you know, it's not twenty and forty. I don't I don't yeah. understand the the the. I know the past few years it hasn't mattered that we haven't won the division. We end up beat have beaten the Braves and you know in the playoffs. But I I don't I don't get this mentality of just conceding the division to the Braves. Like like I know they're great. I know they're a good team. But the biggest difference between the Braves and the Phillies, I think, is the Braves beat bad teams. 
they take it, they win, you know, where the Phillies go out and struggle and lose two out of three to a Pittsburgh or, you know, the White Sox or somebody like that. Somebody that thinks you just go in Reds. and take two out of three, you know? Yeah. Well, the Reds, Braves, I mean, you know, yeah, the Reds lose two out of three to the Reds. Where the Braves go in and they win, they beat those teams. They just beat them, you know? And- I think the Phillies' major problem is offense. And the second major problem, if you look at it a little bit deeper, and I think all of you guys are going to agree with the next few sentences that I say. If I'm a pitcher pitching against the Phillies, I'm not throwing strikes to 75% of the batters. Nope. I'm not doing it. And then 100% of the batters, when I have two strikes, I'm throwing it right down the motherfucking <laughs> middle fastball. I'm, I'm, I'm going to split the goddamn plate and they don't swing. Yeah. Two strikes outside, high, yeah. Right down the middle, like that's the book. You open the book, and they're like outside to 75%, two strikes right down the middle. Rojas, yeah. it doesn't fucking matter where you throw it. It Just doesn't. Do- Just throw a fastball. It doesn't. Yeah. Hey, Johnny, do you think uh, yep. Stott should start every day? Yes, no matter what. I mean, at the occasional rest day, while, like later in the year or something, but he's young. You got to play him every day. I actually think he should be leading off, but you know we're not going to change Topper's mind right now. Um, I, I think Topper's got to have the fear of losing his job before he switches fucking shortbread that leadoff spot. But um, I actually think they should try start at, at the leadoff spot with Turner behind him. But um, yeah, definitely he should play every day. He, he, he can hit. He can hit from both sides. They got to stop this shit this this early in the year, sitting him and Marsh like that early. It's just crazy. So I have a two-parter for you, Dugan. I'm going to tell you the first part and hear your answer and then tell you the second part, okay? All right. In game two of the season, does Harper really need to go asshole over elbows into the camera well and risk injury? Does he need to? No. Um, I don't know. I don't. I, I obviously don't think it was something intentional. I think that was like kind of a low railing there. It went over and, you know hit him in the knee rather than the hip and he flipped over it. Um, I'd say no, you know, but the guy plays hard and I, I don't want to, I don't ever want to take a player's aggressiveness away from him. Um, that's what he needs. That's how he needs to play. That's how he gets himself ready to play. Go, you know, I mean, he makes a lot of base running mistakes because of his aggressiveness, but I, I would rather have a guy make aggressive mistakes than timid mistakes. And be unsure of himself. And a guy like Harper, I, I don't think he can play the game of baseball to his full capability unless his hair is on fire. So he's going to go hard on every play. Yeah. You like right, to see so him that, be a little smarter, a little smarter, but yeah. Kind of yeah, what I was thinking. They just fixed that. They just fixed that, by the way. They put some padding there, and then they said it's it's the, it's the level height now, and uh, it'll be fully fixed before the next homestand. So Aaron Rowan, Rowan and then Aaron Rowan meet Bryce Harper. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, given that answer, you know, do you think with that kind of play and all the other things that um, Bryce does on and off the field, do you think that he's pandering to the people of Philadelphia? No, no. I, 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 I mean, I think the fanatic, you know, paraphernalia and all that <laughs> shit is the, is the pandering to, to Philadelphia. I think playing hard is just Bryce, Bryce Harper. That's his DNA. Yeah. He's a baseball player and he goes hard when, when he's out on the field. And I don't want to ever see, I don't want to ever see that change, you know? Um, but it's also part of the reason why I wouldn't sign him to any kind of extension for another five years, because he's going to get banged up. He's going to get hurt the way he plays the game. You hope moving into the infield um, will maybe limit that exposure. You know, he won't be crashing into walls into the outfield or, you know, firing balls, trying to reach home plate in the air from the warning track and hurting his arm. Um, you know, hopefully playing first base will limit uh, his exposure to injury, but he's going to die for balls. He's going to try and stretch singles in the doubles. He's going to, you know, probably dive into the stands, you know, again, before the season's over. That's just the way he plays. And I wouldn't want to take that aggressiveness away from him. Um, play the way you play, Bryce. That's what made you, that's what made you a superstar. So be, be you. Be that guy. Chris, do you think he's an Eagles fan? Uh no, I don't think he's an Eagles fan. I think That's, I think that I mean that kind of stuff. I, 
Yeah, that kind of stuff. He's a pander. Um, like I said, with the fanatic, you know, wearing all the paraphernalia and he walks around with a Sixers jersey on and this and that. I think all those guys are fans of their teams that they grew up watching. And yeah, you know, he's he's the biggest thing in in in, in this town for baseball. So he's got to look the part. He's got to wear, you know, like a, I think like a guy like Jason Kelsey is is really a Phillies fan and a Flyers fan. But he's been here for 13, 14 seasons. You know, maybe maybe at the end of Bryce's career, he'll really be a fan of these other teams because he, he'll be, have been here so long. But that, yeah, that's the pandering. But his play on the field, I don't, I don't, that's just, that's him as a baseball player. Do you think if he wasn't a Cowboys fan, he would have came out as like a big Eagles fan and wearing all, you know, the <laughs> Eagles stuff? You know what I mean? I think that's yeah. part of it to me. I'm it like, I been. don't know. If this dude was yeah. like a Cardinals fan. People would be like, all right, dude likes the Cardinals or the Raiders. Yeah. Like he's from right. out there. But yeah. Just be I, right. just, I don't give a shit who you like. Just get us a fucking series win. Yeah. 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 I just, I think two things. Um, I think to Chris's point, like he gets access that not a lot of people get. And so sometimes if you are, you have access to folks like, you know, maybe Jeffrey Laurie or Nick Sirianni, like, and you know, from your former team, you know, that they're, brass and their ownership and their you know coaches aren't like these coaches like i could see that shift and the other thing i just thought it was amazing after the game the other day he doesn't want to talk about his three homers he wants to talk about turnbull i thought that was cool so crock quick picks up on that right away and he says so you don't want to talk about your hitting. Um, what about when you threw the ball around with a guy on third? And he's yeah. like, you saw that. You son like he wanted to say, you <laughs> son of a bitch. Yeah. Yeah. Like, thanks a lot, yeah. Crocker. I'm gonna get you back. Like, I could see it in his eyes. I just thought that was cool, so. <laughs> awesome, man. Hey, um <clears throat> Chris. So yeah. I was, yeah, we were going back and forth as we always do, uh, while games are on, and um basically you called the loss. Uh, when Connor Brogdon was getting loose in the bullpen the other night. So I was just wondering, are you studying to be a medium or, uh, you know, is he just <laughs> that bad that you knew that that loss was coming? So, you know, that's one of the things that it, you know, the medium part, like I, I don't think it took a lot or someone who's a, a medium, like to be able to do that. His confidence level that you saw on the mounds last year and we saw in spring training in the limited amount of games where we did see him he just doesn't have it when you're going out there with the defeatist attitude he's not going out there to me you know we've been in this position Mike I, you know if you're going bad you're saying man I hope they don't hit me hard I hope they don't instead of like the other mindset which is like they're not going to I'm going to throw strikes and I'm going to get outs. I got, you know, seven other fielders behind me, myself and the catcher. Um, I think it's a mental game with him, um, to be honest. Uh, I think no one wants to see someone lose their job, right? Because ultimately, I don't know what where he's going to land. And honestly, I don't really care um, because I want to win now. Um, this isn't some reclamation project team. It's a team that's built to win now. And if you're having someone on the squad who didn't deserve to make it, that frankly disgusts me. And it should disgust Pinto and Mercado and the other guys that didn't get there because of this guy, because of these options or, or, or whatever it may be. Um, Brodkin does not have what it takes uh, mentally to be a relief pitcher. If he doesn't have that, he is going to be doing what he's doing, which is looking for a job. It's amazing. I mean, he was so good in uh, 2022 in that, that. I mean, he had like a 2.3 yes, ERA. He, he was dominant. And and that was when I really, I mean, I liked him from the beginning when he first came up just because of the stature and his, his pitch repertoire reminded me of Ryan Matson and how, yep. how dominant Matson was for the Phillies back in the day. I said, this guy could come in with a 97 plus fastball and then that nasty changeup. You know, there's your, there's your setup guy for the next, you know, five, seven, eight years, maybe, you know. Uh, but yeah, Chris, like you said, he just he he's broken. There's something broken in the kid, and it's it's a shame. Like his post game press conference was like that was oh tough to watch. That yeah, was so yeah. tough to watch. It was really bad. I mean, you 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 know, and I know we gave him a bunch of shit on the page, and we ripped him, and 
And that's just us being, you know, being fans and being pissed off that he blew the game. But, you know, the human side, you you, you, just, you sit back the next day and you go, wow, this guy, this guy really, like, he's hurting. Like, he can't, Chris, he can't figure it out. Chris, do you fault him or do you fault Topper for putting him in or, like, whoever chooses for him to be on the team? Like, yeah. I think you know, he was like, in a bad spot. I think they were in a bad spot the other night because they used a bunch of guys the yeah. first two games, you know, that the first couple games, and they were kind of limited to who they had back there. And he, it was kind of like, hey, Connor, you got to – you got to take one on the chin, dude. If you don't have it, you got to yeah. take it on the chin and just get us through this inning. And he, and he just he just couldn't do it. I mean, they had to make the switch, you know, to bring in Nelson. You know, um, I think they were trying to save Nelson if they went further in the extra innings because Nelson's a guy that could give you, you know, multiple, you know, multiple innings. And, uh, yeah, I think it was just a bad spot. Like, the guy just he didn't have it, and the Phillies didn't have anybody they could, you know, yank him out for. He just had to eat it. He just had to take it. You know, could he be and, Alvarado? Possibly. You know, he yeah, could be that yeah. project. I don't know, but. I mean, there's a shot that he ends up at, with the Phillies in AAA. If he clears waivers, they could, yeah. they yeah. could you know, they could assign him, you know, down. It, it could send him all the way back to, you know, right. Clearwater and let him start, let him start from the beginning, you know, and just go down there and work his yeah. way back through, you know. Yep. I mean, we've seen this happen before with guys. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, we talked about like Rick and Keel. I mean. What a top prospect that guy was, and then all of a sudden he got in that playoff game, and he he you know he couldn't throw a strike. I mean, yeah, he couldn't throw a pitch out. You know, like it was it was crazy. You know, um, and he ended up never pitching again and converting to an outfielder. But um, it, it's a shame. It's a shame. We've seen that in other positions too. Mackie Sasser as a catcher and Chuck Knobloch at second base. They you just get that mental block, and that's something you've done a million times. You just you can't do it again. Like your muscle memory loses, you lose your muscle memory, you lose your, your focus or whatever. It's just, it's a shame. And I, you know, I hope the kid figures it out. He's still young enough to really have a nice career, but yeah, it might, it's probably not here. It's probably not here. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of someone uh, that didn't start the season, well, John, I'm going to give you this one because he's your boy. How short of a rope does Rojas have, and who do we call up? Should we send him to Leo? Oh, I got that answer right away. Um, I give it. Um, some people might be thinking I'm being drastic. I give it another week, tops. I give it another week, tops, and I got Cody Clemens on deck. The, in the first week, in the first week, he's he's killing it so far. He could play first. I don't first. think it's drastic. I'm fucking pissed off. You said a week. Yeah. I'm ready to start well, doing it tomorrow. You know, <laughs> you know, you know the, the people with the, the people that like care more about their heart than like winning. Like yeah. I know it's my boy Mike, but I, I I gotta be realistic. Like I give it another week. Like by the end of next weekend, if he doesn't turn it around, all right, you're down. Cody's up. Cody could play first base and spell Harper if Harper needs a day off. He could play the outfield. He could play the infield. You can move him around. Dude's got a homer, two RBIs, three runs, and a decent, a pretty, like a 333 average in the first week down there. He's killing it. Um, I, it's another guy that I, I, I think I said on the one uh, right before the season started that I wish there was two spots because I wish he would have made the team. But um, that's who I'm calling up. Like kind I mean, of to Chris's point, though, just to add on a little bit, do we want him to become the Connor Brogdon of the offense? Like he's got to be frustrated with how he's performing, right? He's got yeah. one hit, and it's because he hit it off the cup end of the bat, and he's fast. He didn't. He didn't lace one to left. You know what I mean? So right. Like I was got to go and figure it out. So when he came today up, would be a good day, the off day, to send him yeah. to Lehigh. And bring exactly. whoever Cody Clemens, when he came, Wilson, whoever. And that's a good point too, Mike, because I think we play like fourteen out of fifteen or something. Like we don't get another off day for a minute. But um, last year I fell in love with it. You know, it was a great story. Like because I was talking about this kid last year, but I didn't expect him up in the bigs. I'm thinking he's going to get promoted to the Lehigh Valley, see him there for a year. 
Then they called him up. I'm like, oh, kid, oh, that's my boy. And he was hitting. He was playing elite defense. And I was all in love. Then the playoffs hit. John, oh. could you hold up a sec? We have a uh, comment that's really important. So the weather center is getting distracted because of the scoreboard behind you. So if you could change the scoreboard, <laughs> um, they'd appreciate it. <laughs> so so that uh, that could lead me right but, into um, my next question for for Dugan. If you're if you're not uh, if you're finished, John. You tell me. Uh, I just want to squeeze him real fast. Like, mm -hmm. I was in love with him and all, but, like, if he didn't get it in all spring training, I get Ke Kevin Long was like, it's a process, it's a process. Yeah, the Sixers had a process, too. We're still fucking in it. So, um, <laughs> if he didn't figure it out, like, send him down, get his mechanics right, get him regular bats and start him, like, every night out there, um, you know, in center, get him regular bats, work with the hitting coach down there, and, um, you know, when he's like, when he's uh, steady, when his bat's steady after a while, don't just like have a steady bat for a week and bring him back up. Like, I need to see some, you know, some regu regularity in the bat before you bring him back. But, um, yeah, I'd say I, at the, at the um, longest by the end of next weekend, like, I, you got you to gotta go down and figure it out, bro. Rojas and Roman Quinn are the same person, except one doesn't get hurt as much. <laughs> My big Roman thing with Quinn. Rojas is, you know, what did he work on all offseason? Because he swings from his, his muscles. Ass. Every yeah. pitch. Every yeah. pitch he swings from his ass. You're not a power hitter, bro. You're a speed guy. Right. Ball on the Average ground, guy. Drives, hard ground balls, beat shit out, steal bases, although he's a terrible base runner, too. Um his speed outruns yeah, he's a lot of his, his mistakes, you know. Like yes. He's getting picked yeah. off. He's getting picked off. He's but, getting um, caught. Why is he swinging out of his ass? Two strikes. I don't. Swinging out of his ass. Come on, dude. Cut the swing down. Put the goddamn ball in play. Your, your asset is your speed, not your power, you know. Uh, real qu real quick, quick, Mike, uh, yeah. um, before you ask the next question, I want to go around real fast. What – what uh, um everybody – what uh, what average would you say is acceptable for him? Like a minimum, I would say like two forty. I would accept like two forty out of that whole out of that slot. Like I'd be okay with that as long as he doesn't make the mistakes base running and he plays the defense. What, like, what do you guys think? Mike's asking the questions here, John. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> no, you're good. I, I need I need jerk to, I need jerk to two eighty. Uh, okay. Wow. Man. I don't think Ooh, he's going to get there. That's a little much. No, I don't think I'm he's going to get there. I'm in that 230, 240 range, but he's yeah, got to walk, too. He's got to get walks, yeah. too. He can't, yep. He's got to yep. get on yeah. base. He, you know, It's got to not just be, a, you know, the only time he gets on base is with a hit. He's got to learn to walk and be a little more patient and use the asset that he has. I want to treat okay. him like a 1970s and 80s shortstop. You know what I mean? Like, he's the number eight hitter. He can move guys along. Uh, he can bunt well, and he's hitting – 230 to 250 with you know 20 sacrifice bunts um very few grounded double plays just because he's you know i don't think he has the smarts or bat skills to be able to like you know hit things the other way and you know no when to bunt um but he's a stone pole hitter with that swing he's yeah he's flying, he's flying yeah. open trying to yank everything immediately yeah it's all about the launch angle you know that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, sorry, Mike. Chris alluded. Chris, no, you're good. Chris alluded to this earlier. So Dugan, a, here's a quote from Topper. And uh, this, uh, before we posted this, uh, a buddy of mine have said this to me. So shout out to have. Uh, Castellanos told me he's getting bothered by the new scoreboard and that he's not used to it. Can you uh, give us your opinion on um, the, first of all the the comment from Castellanos, and second of all. Um, Topper actually throwing that out to the media as like an excuse. It's 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 fucking embarrassing. It's it's a fucking embarrassment. Um, it it's it's an excuse, and I, I you know there's no there's no room for excuses. And I I wasn't an outfielder. I I rarely played the outfield. I was an infielder most of my life. But I had I think I have a pretty good knowledge of the way you play every position on the field just from playing as long as I did. I didn't know the outfielder looked at the wall. I thought you looked back for the ball. And when you hit the warning track, you kind of knew how many steps you had, and you stuck your hand out to feel the wall. So what the hell is he looking at? Now, I could see if the ball's over your head and you're just going to play it off the wall, but 
how's that affected him making catches? You're supposed to be looking at the ball, which is puts the fence behind you. And the light is he is saying the, the LED board. is so bright that it's causing vision problems looking forward? Because, I, Chris, I think Nick can't see. That's the maybe, only maybe, explanation maybe, I have. Maybe that's like, like I put some fucking horse blinders on him or some some shit, you know? I mean, those guys are out there wearing the shysties and the underwear on their face. Give them some yeah. fucking oh. horse blinders, you know? Block off oh. the outside corner. Yeah, just oh. like this, you know? Fucking I was snapping blinders. about that shit last night. Snapping. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I, mean, I, I, you know, I don't Rangers. know. Did any of you guys ever play the outfield? I thought the wall, you know, and you feel I did. for it. You feel yeah. for it. You don't look for not, it. Right field. Not, right field not right only here. do you kind of know how many steps, they exactly know. It's like two and a half, three, one, and whatever their stride is, they know exactly how many you steps. The dirt. Is. As soon as you hit the dirt, you know where you're at. And you're yeah. supposed to be watching, watching the ball. It's called the warning track for a reason. It's reason warning for you reason. for something. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's I think it's a piss poor. It's just, it's just. It's, you know, it's just another thing. It's a distraction from what's going on. Oh, oh, the lights. Oh, you know, no, there were two balls you should have caught last night, and you didn't get close to either one of them. And it's probably because he's so goddamn in his own head with his bat that he's not fucking out there paying attention defensively. He's not ready to play. And, Good you call. know, I'm sick of that shit. I'm sick of his body language already six games in. He, and he had a great year last year. Not going to lie. He had a, his numbers. He had a really great year. His numbers looked good. There were patches where he was bad, um, but there were patches where he was really good, um, which is typical most of our lineup. But uh, you know, great in the beginning part in the Brave series, and then he went shit cold in in the Diamondback series. But the guy's body language is terrible. Um, his at bats have been terrible. His defense has been terrible. And then to come out with an excuse like that, just like, come on, dude, like fucking icing on the cake, you know. People didn't like you already, you know. You just you just fucking ruined it for you know everybody. People that I mean, like you might not like you, you know. I I know it was cold, but he should have had the third button undone. Mm. Catch the fucking ball. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Chris, bear with yeah. me. This is a long question, but all right. I have a point. <clears throat> so everything about the Ricardo Pinto story screams Hollywood feature film. Big league player struggles has to go uh, on a worldwide quest to develop his skills to ultimately get back to major league baseball along the way. He has mentors and coaches that guide him. They teach him a splitter because his changeup sucks and he ends up signing a minor league contract back with the same club. He, ha- he was uh, when he left the league. Then on his call up day, Back to the big club. There's no plane from upstate New York to get him to Philly in time. So he catches the traffic, gets dropped off at the center field gate rather than the player's entrance, arrives in the dugout in the fourth inning, and then completes a fairy tale four inning save in his re debut. Who plays uh, Pinto in the movie, and what do you think we can expect the rest of the season with him? I mean, I don't know if Carmen San Diego is a real person, but I feel like he would be good um, to play Pinto because Pinto was like he's been in playing in Australia, Korea, Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, Antarctica. Caribbean. Yep. Yeah. The, you know, really all over. So, um, you know, I, I I think that I would probably have to say like Carmen San Diego makes sense to me. Whoever this person, I don't know if it's even a. Oh, it could be a woman, but I, I, I think I, it I is, but that's that. all right. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, this is 2024. We can do that now. Um, I, the part of the amazingness of it is like, it seems impossible that Phillies couldn't get a plane. <laughs> like uh, they're, they're paying a hundred, you know, what, 250 million for this uh, whole team. And they can't just. <laughs> get a plane in Rochester. Uh, It's not like it's like the Outback somewhere, you know, like what the fuck? They gave that to the Rockies. Yeah. I, I, I feel like, you know, driving from New York to Philly is like always a terrible idea, but when they know it's like time sensitive, like maybe they should have thought that out. I mean, it wouldn't be as, as a great of a story. Um, You know what? I don't know uh, what actor I would want to play him because I'm like trying to think like 
I don't, what Latin actors do I even know? I don't know. I, I don't watch Telenova for like the male actors, if you know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that that's a tough one. You, you, you know, you, you almost go to like the, I, I could go with uh, Will Smith, Matthew McConaughey. Like, I, I don't know. L- Lou Diamond I was about to say, <laughs> Lou Diamond Phillips. And then, I feel uh, like his show could be Chris Rock. Topper. <laughs> Because I, I want Chris like Rock. Pinto to have like Jerry Pearls for some reason in my head he does. Eddie Murphy. And I want it to be like uh well, I'm thinking Chris Rock and CB4, like when Got he it. was playing in that one, and I'm like just dripping Jerry Pearls. I just feel like Pinto should have CB4. <laughs> it's a, there ain't cool. got a play. Oh, I knew it was a play. It was no play. <laughs> his splitter was think, splitter was nasty. I was just gonna say, what do you what do you think we can expect the rest of the, the rest of the way? Composure, guts, yeah. um, doing whatever it takes for a team, being happy to be here, and you know he's different than every other guy on the goddamn team because of that. Uh, you know, not silver spoons, but a lot of them are. You know, in, in a way, um, this guy, like, holy shit, man, like. That's a story to end all stories. We're going to be talking about that for years to come. Yeah. Um, no matter what happens with this season, that's a moment. Um, it's you know was pretty cool. I, I think at least for the uh, the short term, while Walker's out and Turnbull's in the rotation, Pinto takes that that long man role, multiple yeah. inning type role. But I mean, if he throws like he did the other night. I think you got to find a spot for him. I mean, I'm sure like Nick Nelson can get bumped or, you know, um, there's somebody down there that we can, we can move. Um, but I mean, if he can come in and pitch like a sixth inning, you know, against like a, a lineup coming up with three straight righties and he's got that yeah. splitter working, like he could be that kind of like middle guy, like that, you know, that bridge guy to get to the Stroms, Alvarado's, Soto's, Dominguez yep. types in the back half, you know, and, I mean, he threw the ball well. He threw the ball real, and like you said, Chris, he's he's a hungry guy. He wants he, yeah. he after finally getting here, and he's gonna wanna he's gonna wanna stick. So I want Steve Jelts to play him. I just changed my mind. <laughs> there you go. Somebody Nino else. Said, oh. Somebody else. J- Jason online said T Mac is Pinto. Make it fun. <laughs> All right, guys. You know the rules. First trivia question. Shout your name out if you if you want to answer. So, Kyle Schwarber hit the Phillies' longest home run since StatCast started tracking home run distances in 2015, hitting a 488-foot blast at Petco Park in Game 1 of the uh, 2022 National League Championship Series. Who hit the Phillies' longest home run in the regular season? I would say Chris and Ryan Howard. Uh, Incorrect. John, uh, yeah, stairs incorrect. Hmm. Dugan, you want to take I was gonna go with Howard, but I'll, I'll throw a guess out. Um, how about Bobby Estalea? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> not even close, but hey, it was uh, actually he had that three home run game now, remember? <laughs> he had some bombs. Yeah, he had those time, sweet was, 90210 uh, yeah, sideburns. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah. That's in the uh, way back machine. <laughs> yeah, it was It was actually Kyle Schwarber, 483 feet uh, Atlanta, at Atlanta on 9-18-23. So not that question. long ago. Same answer. It's a trick question. Yeah. Trick not question, a Mike. Right, at, right out of the gate here. Good. Come on, man. I think that's the one I caught in the backyard. I should have known that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that I think you're right. Mike, you uh, sure it cool. wasn't you sure it wasn't Tony Longmire? <laughs> um positive. Oh, let's see here. Dugan. Is bad baseball more about the lack of coaching or more about or does it have more to do with the players? I don't think it's bad coaching because you see them in spring training. You see all the videos of on the backfield working on, on the fundamentals. And, and uh, you know, I, I do believe the Phillies stress fundamentals, and I do believe they practice fundamentals. I think it's mental lapses on the players. I think it's, it's you know, 
it's it's that you know routine ground ball that you've fielded a million times in your life and you and you don't really focus on it and you end up kicking it or sailing the throw uh you know getting picked off the base is like you know oh I got his move down and I'm I'm gone and and you're picked off um I think it's I think it's a little laziness on the player's part when fundamentals break down um obviously there's things the coaching can do when that happens multiple times there needs to be a fucking coming to Jesus meeting with that player. Like this can't keep happening, you know, get fucking focused and, you know, make the plays, stop getting picked the fuck off um, or whatever. But I, I think the Phillies, you know, like every other major league team, they drill it, they drill it, they drill it, they practice it, they practice it, practice it. And then it's on to the players to carry it into the game. And it, it's more of a mental mistake than a, a physical mistake. And Chris, do you, you think this focused. conversation's happening with Rojas on the two strikes swinging at his ass because he keeps doing it? So they're I would nuts. hope so. I, I can't imagine there's not a person that's getting a paycheck from the Phillies that shouldn't be able to see what he's doing and saying, "Dude, what the fuck are you doing? Like, cut your swing down. You're you're a speed guy. You're not a power guy. You know, cut your swing down." And, and, and it's a shame because doesn't that's what's going to be eventually get him out of league i mean defensively he could play center field for every team in baseball he could be the starting center center fielder you know uh but if you're not going to hit you're not going to you're not going to stay around it's not it's not the 80s like you're referring to chris with the weak hitting shortstop you got to have nine yeah. guys that can hit the ball in this league you know in this day and age you can't have yeah. that that one guy that's a defensive specialist you know you just you, you can't afford you're not going to win that way you need guys that can hit you know I keep going back to the you may run like Hayes, but you hit like shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey guys, I, I put it up on the screen, but Nancy knew that Schwarber hit the longest home run. Well, Thanks, Nancy. Nancy. Good job, Nancy. Smarter than a DPF her. <laughs> she no wasn't surprise. tricked. She wasn't tricked by Mike. She wasn't tricked. <laughs> Hey, John, um, how much do you think lineup configuration is contributing to the slow start of the plate th thus far? Ooh, a little bit. Um, I'm not going to beat the I'm not going to beat a dead horse with the Schwerber thing. But I mean, I, we all know none of us agree with it. But um, I think a little bit. I think like or I mean, Rojas at the bottom, it's just it's, it's an automatic out at the nine hole. Um, if it wasn't for Harper the other night, Stubbs would have been an automatic. I mean, Stubbs was an automatic out. Stubbs is always an automatic out. But um, JT, and I don't like JT in the cleanup hole. I don't like Schwerber at the top. Uh, I think Schwerber should be fourth or fifth, drive into more runs instead of either like solo, me meaningless solo homer. I mean, that's great. Like, last night in the group chat, I put, ah, oh, Schwerber solo, yawn. Cause that's how I felt. I'm like, Oh, that's great. Like we're not winning the game. Like that's uh, great. Personal stat. Everybody gets a free standard and that's cool. Like, that's cool. Like we can go over and deem our free beer. But we lost the fucking game. So like, that's, that's the shit that pisses me off. He either gets singles or he, you know, or he gets a, a meeting with solo Homer. I'd rather be in the fourth or fifth hole. Um, you know, driving in some more runs and br bringing in some more people have Stadi at the top, just switch it up. I think, all of it, but to answer the question, uh, I think a little bit the, the configuration had does have a little bit to do with it. So Tom, Tom put in here, nobody is hitting from top to bottom. Currently, wouldn't make a difference. That's the whole point of this question. <laughs> yeah. They're right. not hitting. So is is it They're time not. to make it make a change? I think I, I, just, you know, yeah. I, I, I mean, I mean, going with John. I mean, I've I've you know, I've already resigned to the fact that, and I've kind of grown on. The Schwarber thing at at leadoff, yeah. like I think, especially if he's going to swing the bat the way he has to start the season, I'm fine with him batting there. He gets on base, he scored over 100 runs, drove in a, over 100 runs, walked over 100 times. Like he pretty much did everything you'd want a leadoff hitter to do when you look at his stats. You know, um, he does clog the bases a little with his, but he's running better this year than he was last year. But I think the biggest problem with this lineup, and John touched on it, is they don't really have a four hitter. They really don't have a guy that can protect Harper in that lineup. Yeah. Um, you would hope that, you know, for $25 million a year, Castellanos was that guy. And you could, you know, have that left, right, left, right uh, at the, at the top of your lineup, but he's, he's not, he, he's too streaky. I mean, yeah. I, I, maybe, maybe a guy like Bohm, he didn't do great in the playoffs, but he's a guy that is pretty 
good bat the ball. Um, 20 plus home runs last year. Maybe he slides into the four eventually and gives, you know, he's good with men on base, you know, drive in some runs. But I think that's the biggest, the biggest hole in that lineup is the four spot. I think I just, so yeah, yeah, Schwarber I three, four would be perfect because they, they you know, that would protect, yeah. you know, Harper and cause they're, yes. they're going to pitch to him then. Why would you pitch to Harper? Yeah. 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 I'm not doing but then, it. But then who, and also, I'm, I'm eating. Doing. Also, I'm eating. I'm I'm eating crow right now because, like, remember right before the season happened, and like right before, like as the beginning games are coming up, I said, "Oh, leave Castellanos in the seven hole. He thrived there last year. He fucking blows so far there this year." But I don't want him at the four either. But he's got to figure that shit out, his spot out. But I agree with Chris. Like. And put Schwarber down at the he'll, he'll see better pitches. He could drive in more runs, like in that spot. I just I like Real Muto in the two. I like Stott in the one. I like you oh, know Castellanos okay. in the eight. Because <laughs> I so guess if I if him. I had my choice, I'd have Bohm as the two. I think Bohm's a perfect two hitter with that inside out swing, hitting the could ball right field. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I love Bohm as a two hitter, but Boy yeah. Boise but, has Stott Turner Harp. Boom, Schwarber, JT, stop, Marsh, Casty blows, Pache. <laughs> and you know Casty what, fellas? Blows Pache. Is that some inside locker Whoa. room? Whoa. Break it there. Casty blows Pache. Whoa. Hey, guys. Hey, you know, what that's, news. you know what that spells? CBP. <laughs> <laughs> Punctuation matters, boys. That's right. That's you, know right. What, you know what's crazy about the lineup shit, too? That's what spring training is for. And shame on Topper for putting the same fucking lineup out there every day in spring training. Like, well, with the exception of like the minor leaguers and all that. Once he put all the vets shame in, on, shame on Topper for these guys only getting fucking twenty at bats in spring training. That, that too. I mean, that too. Come on. Yeah. And, and I, he, I he remember put the same exact lineup in like the whole last week of spring training. I'm like, here we go. The first week of the regular season is going to be like this. Here we go. I remember back in the day they said they needed between like 70 and 80 at bats to be ready and these guys got like 20 yeah. or 30. Yeah. That's the right. bats don't travel to away games like it's just the country club when they're down there. Yeah, yeah. you got you got Rupert, you got Rupert Rupenstein on a fucking uh, non-roster <laughs> invitee. He got he like got 20 at bats. He got more at bats than Harper. Yeah, he got more at bats than Harper. And and he got a higher average of fucking Rojas and he ain't even here. <laughs> Love you Rupert. So, <laughs> let's talk a little let's talk a little bit about pitching um chris spencer turnbull pitched well in his phillies debut against the reds five innings seven books one on under and run should he continue this type of performance where does that leave taiwan walker when he is healthy uh i think that's going to be a tough decision right because turnbull has the uh you know the capability of being a stud he was drafted probably as a number two or a number three starter. He's not a number one, but he was a top 10 draft pick, if I'm correct. Uh, had some tough luck, had some injuries, didn't pitch for a little bit, but like, yo, you saw what this dude had. Calm, composed, beautiful movement in and out. Um, nothing's over the middle with this guy too much. Uh, I, I think that Walker is either your long reliever guy and he's out of the mix if this guy keeps performing because how can you take this guy out? I mean, I guess they could say we're going we could give Walker that spot and put Turnbull along and I'm assuming that's what's going to happen, but I think that there's value and it's not our money. Who wants Walker back on the team? Like do any of you guys want him back right now? Nope. No. I, I don't. So pay him to leave. He's yeah, still getting the not. money, whether he sucks or whether he doesn't, you know, whether he plays or whether he doesn't. So I'm more of the minds like, you know, it's a win now. I think he has a bug in his ass. And I would too, honestly, because like he didn't see the light of day. And, you know, now he has a mysterious and it's, it's never anything that can be imaged, right? It's always some nebulous. Oh, I have a back. I have a knee. It's, I have an arm problem. Like I, I, we haven't heard MRI or anything like that. I, I think he's bullshitting. I just think he's bullshitting. Um, and the Phillies are like, well, all right, well, we got Turnbull, so look what he just did. Um, yeah. 
difficult situation, uh, but I think because of his veteran and what he's getting paid, he's going to play. And it sucks because Turnbull deserves three, four, five more starts. And what if yes. he performs in the same way? And what success to Turnbull for you guys? To me, five innings, you know, three or less runs. That's it. That's success. He's a five. He's, he, he's your yeah. five. So that, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Five innings, five innings, seven strikeouts, one on and run is overachieving. Yeah, that's special, yeah. you know. But you know, five and three, like that's attainable by this dude. And I, I think know? if he was if he was stretched out, he probably goes another inning or so in that game. Mm -hmm. um, I think he does they, too. Yeah, yeah. He, he had a limit, and and once he hit it, they got him out of there. But yeah, he threw. I I, I like. I thought he was aggressive too, Chris. I thought he attacked hitters. Uh, he didn't nibble. Um, his yeah. ball had good movement. Like, I mean, he went right at guys and I, I, I like that yeah. out of starter, you know, I love, I love that. Don't fucking I'm, nibble. Go at guys. I'm going to ask Duke. I'm going to ask you a, another pitching question, but then I got to get to some of these comments cause they're solid gold. Uh, Sanchez's fastball command and the filthy movement of his changeup were dominant against the reds for five innings. Uh, with that, I was wondering who you thought had the best left-handed changeup. Uh, you could go on the Phillies or, uh, you know, all time. Yeah, we were we were kicking that around in our group chat the other night. And, uh, you know, and we, we talked about Cole Hamels and how good his changeup was. Um, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned Johan Santana. I thought he had a great uh, changeup back in the day. Yeah. Jamie, Jamie Moyer was a good changeup pitcher. Even a guy going back a little further with the Cardinals, John Tudor. John Tudor was a really uh, crafty left-hander. Yeah, real crafty. Um, those would probably be the top four guys. I mean, it's such a dominant pitch when you can throw it. And, 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 uh, Sanchez is, is nasty. It's so good. It, uh, it moves and it drops. And, uh, when he's, when he can spot his fastball and throw that pitch, he's, he's, he's special. He can be really good. Sanchez. It's all about that fastball control for him and hitting his spots, but he was really good the other night. Um, I thought he settled in nice after giving up a couple of early runs. Same thing with Suarez. I thought Suarez settled in nice after giving up some early runs. Uh, other than Noel, I think the Philly starting pitching has been really, really good for a team that's starting out two and four. Uh, I thought the starters have been really good. Uh, yeah. So that's that, that's encouraging going forward if they can continue to throw the way they have. But, I, yeah, I'd say Hamels and Santana, Moyer, Tudor. Cool. <clears throat> Andrew's on fire, so – Johnny, what's the best minor league ballpark he wants to know? Mm, I haven't been to many, uh, honestly. Um, so I think uh, you have to go to. I think you have to go to Truist Park in Charlotte. He said it looks awesome on TV. He's watching that. Um, I've seen Orioles some White Sox AAA game right now. Yeah, I've seen some. I've seen some pictures of some. Uh, there's uh, the one in Indianapolis is really nice. Uh, the, I mean, I've never per been personally to them. The, the, the nicest one I've personally been to, um, right, Lehigh Valley. Um, Blue Cross is nice too, but Lehigh Valley is nice. But yeah, like Indianapolis is one. Uh, there, there's a few. I just can't think of the names of the teams right now. But um, as the I watch, in Australia games, looked I'll, pretty good. That was a cool, <laughs> yeah. The Adelaide Giants' field was fucking beautiful, man. Like right off the beach. It just might have just might have been that it was three in the morning. I'm telling and you, it was like ten beers deep. But <laughs> I'm telling you what, I'm telling you what, I'll be 46 in May. By the time I'm 50, I'm going over there for a fucking winter and cover that shit. Write that down. Or at least somewhere. for a week. I'm, I'm gonna do like a week vacation, go over there and cover them live. That would be cool. Andrew, again, thoughts on Reese versus the Mets. Fuck the Mets. Fuck the Mets. The, Fuck Reese. Almost dude. the best part of the weekend. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah. I'm not I'm I'm not a big Reese guy, but Yeah, I'm not. Gain some respect and um yeah, yeah. I it, you know, fuck the Mets. Jeff McNeil's a fucking punk. Yeah, you he's hundred percent. I'm punk. big on like, you know, a grown man doing the crying motion. 
I love that shit. Like that's one of my favorite. That and it's in a hockey, demoralizing. It's demoralizing. Like <laughs> when like a hockey guy wants to fight another hockey guy and he does the punching motion and then does the sleeping motion and then point at him. Those are my two favorites. Or this, like this is uh, this yeah. is always my or like uh, Chris TK for the uh, Flyers. They make faces at people. Like, yeah, yeah. blowing a kiss yeah. is a good one. That's a good one. But, um, you know what? I mean, I've, the slide wasn't even that bad. I didn't even think the slide was nah, that bad. It was late. Nah. But shit, I grew up playing middle infield my whole fucking life. And I can't tell you how many times I got flipped ass overhead. You know, like. And look uh, at your knee. Yeah, no shit. But, <laughs> but you know what? You, you, knew, you knew you had to be quick. Now they make yeah. these rules about you can't make contact. And these guys stand on the fucking bag. They don't. Get the fuck out of the way. The guy's right. sliding. You're going to get hit. Get the fuck out of the way. But it's like, yeah. like like Jack McNeil never grew up playing that way. Or he wasn't in the majors when a takeout slide existed. Now all of a right. sudden, you, you know, put these guys in fucking goddamn big blow-up suits so they don't get fucking hurt. I'm sick of, like, you can slide to the fucking base. If you're there, you get fucking knocked over. It's, it's, Add it to the it's list, Dugan. Add it to the list. Remember a couple episodes ago, we were talking about rule changes and shit. Yeah. I said, bring, I said, next that Buster Posey shit. Bring back the takeout slide. Fuck it. Old school. Dugan was uh, playing second. I'm on first base and I'm like, you know, a double plays coming up. I came at Dugan like spikes high and like he knew to look out. I'm only kidding. I really was never on first base. <laughs> like I fucking barely got on. <laughs> but I would have so, went after him, and he knew it. <laughs> oh, I hey, the, a guy I played, a guy I played high school ball with and college ball with, played with him for like eight years. We were real good friends. He came at me the hardest of any player I've ever played against, and I knew it. I knew the way he played the game, and I knew fucking he's going to come down this line hard, and he's going to try and get me on a double play. And I, I, I fucking like ballerina it out of the way. He clipped my ankle. And I turned back to him. I said, you almost got me, you motherfucker. And he's like, I was coming. And I said, no shit. I knew you were. I knew you yep. were. Because that's the way he played. And that's the way I played. And that's the way we uh, all grew up playing. You played the hard. You went into the base hard. You know, you weren't trying to hurt anybody. But you you fucking turn a double play over my head, motherfucker. I'm going to I'm gonna take you out, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, Jack McNeil's just a punk. Fuck him. Fuck the Mets. Fuck the pitcher that threw it. Reese and couldn't even fucking hit him. Be a man and fucking Idiot. hit him if you're gonna throw at him. Out. Yeah. And fuck and the rainbow. Head. Yeah. Fuck the rainbow cookie egg roll that City Field has too. Oh boy. <laughs> so uh, there's the weather, and oh, oh, and and Stefan. They're on oh. my Bauer train, guys. Ah, they're on the choo choo. So I want to say something about the weather center. These dudes, like, or, or this Ooh, group, I don't even know if it's dudes, <laughs> like, they should be the goddamn Phillies weather people because they called what was going to happen, and they knew, like, these guys are better than what the, whatever the hell the Phillies are doing. So, yeah. you know, the weather center, do what you got to do to get in there, and you're giving them the right calls. I appreciate it. The Phillies are listening to John Belarus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, a re- yeah he, he's a fucking real estate agent now. He's not even a weatherman anymore. <laughs> hey Jason wants to know if Kirkering's over the flu yet. I would love to know that too. April 9th. April 9th, he'll be back. Every he's coming back, baby. I got the jersey ready. All right, cool. Hey, um I had one for you, Johnny. On his current trajectory, do you think Bryce uh, could become the greatest Philly of all time. Yes, but I see. That's a good question. I, I think so, yes. But I think I have a feeling in the last maybe five years of his deal, he's going to be a DH. He's not going to be a first no more. There's going to be someone else at first. Like he's just going to strictly bat and then, you know, get his stats that way. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I could see it happening. As long as he stays healthy and doesn't do any, you know, running the cameras and shit. You know. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm going to yeah. say the most he can ever get high, he can ever get is three. Schmidt, Carlton, whoever's next. I think he can get to I three. Mean, he could get, I'm just saying he can get up there. Like, I don't he's know about get, top he's overall. Overtake, he's not going to overtake. Yeah, I don't Schmidt. think – I don't know about a top overall, but he could get – he can get on that Rushmore. You know what I mean? Oh, he can, yeah. He can oh, reach yeah. it. He can, he can get, get up there. 
he can, he can he can get up there as long as he stays healthy. And like I said, I see someone else playing first base like for his last few years or so. If he doesn't win it ring, though, I'm not putting him up there. That's yeah, that's true. That's you so know, that's tough for the, me. I just because the two guys, it. Duke and said they want a ring. So exactly, and, and the Schmidt, next like, the next couple probably did too. Butley and Rollins and yeah. Howard, you know. I mean, they yeah. they won one too. To unseat Schmidt, you have to be the best player at your position ever. at your position. He's ever. not going to be the best ever. first baseman. It's impossible. He's not going to be the best first baseman. No. Dave agrees with you. Uh, the weather center that he needs a ring to be a solid third. So, yeah. Yep. Um, let's do one more trivia and then wrap it up guys. It's already, it's already late. Um, Philly's trivia. Ready? Remember call out your name if you want to answer and I'll make this one multiple guess. Ready? Ooh. Which Phillies reliever has the most strikeouts in a single season since 1970? Jake Diekman, Hector Neris, Yugeth Urbina, or Al Holland? John. Johnny. Oh, shit. I, I forget the second fucking answer. It was the second one you said. I forget the, <laughs> the name already. Dugan. He, he was Hec Hector <laughs> yeah, Neris. Okay. Dugan, go. Yeah. That's what I'll I was go going for. It. Yeah, I'll go steal it. I was going to steal yeah, it. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Was that your That's answer? Weird. Even is it Oogie? Is it going Neris? Yeah. Neris is right. Extra credit if you know how many and what year. Twenty. That's that's rough. Oh. 102 in 2016. 2016. Ooh, damn, I was a wild guy. I was going to say 2019 or something. Cool, guys. Okay. Hey, man, um, I always say this, but uh, this has been a blast. Uh, I'll go around the horn. Any last uh, thoughts on opening week, uh, Johnny? Um, It's been a shit show, but I expect it to get better. Like Dugan, like Dugan's little slogan under his name there. It is early. Um, I, but they're paid to play the fucking game right, and I want to see improvement this weekend. I expect nothing less than a fucking sweep this weekend, and go into next weekend like full guns blazing, and let's let's have a fucking strong April like this. This I'm looking at all of our opponents for the rest of the month. Like, there's no reason we can't tear through all every fucking body and win every series, or at least get get a couple of each. You know, like one a game, a couple games out of the Pirates four. But, um, yeah, just uh, clean up the shit show, man. Clean up your mistakes, improve on your mistakes, and uh, real quick. I don't know if any DPFers live around that way, but I'll be at Lakewood for the game Sunday to see Jordan Disson. He just got bumped up from uh, Clearwater. I can't make uh, – um, I got uh, tickets for Sunday. I'll be behind home plate. So if any DPFers, I'll have a beer with you or whatever. And uh, fuck the Mets. Dugan? Uh, disappointing. I, I, I mean, it, I was just disappointed. I really thought I, the Phillies, you know, I mean, playing the Braves to come out of the gates, not, not, not a great start. You know, it's hard. It's a tough, it's a tough series, but they did not play well. If they would have won one out of three and played well, I might have a different opinion. They didn't play well in the first two games. Um, and they got lucky in the third game. I mean, if they don't overturn that Rojas double play, who knows what happened? They could have got swept in that series. Uh, so I'm really disappointed with the quality of their play, the quality of their at-bats, the quality of the base running. Uh, but I do think it's going to get better. I do think they're a good team. I, um, But I'm disappointed. I, I think we came into the season all hyped up, and they let us down in these first six games. Chris? Uh, so I normally go through, you know, the ups and downs of the season. And, you know, there's always those occasional games where you're just like, I'm done. I want to shut it off early. I don't. But you get that kind of like feeling. Um, I haven't had it this early yet, but I did the other day. Um, and then you start to feel like 
you know, if Nick don't care, why do I care? Um, so it's a little early for me to apathy to be coming in uh, and just being like, you know, I'd resign to a loss um, and not any hope that they'll come back. But when the offense is playing the way it is, that's simply, you know, the fact of the matter. The Phillies are not a team that can play really well from behind um, because they just seem not to have whatever it is that takes that kind of allows them to push through and do the right things. So that worries me. The first week was not good. Uh, a couple other things that I want to leave everyone with is if you do not listen to Larry Anderson, this dude isn't going to be around forever. I, every home game where he's on, like I have the radio on, it's a little out of sync. Larry Anderson is a gem. He's our last real link to Harry. Um, and he brings up Harry a lot. And like, I think like, I don't know if he's going to be doing it past this year. We don't. So give Larry a listen. Uh, if you think we're angry and negative, <laughs> Larry is a thousand times worse. Yeah. He just doesn't curse as much. But he's yeah, like, this umpire is brutal. This guy is terrible. You know, and he's like, you know, I don't want to be here. It's it's awesome. Uh, the other part of it is, you know, for those of you who our parents are around kids. Uh, it's like, this is going to be one of those Aesop fables type of things. Uh, and I'll get to a point very quickly. You know, what are you having for dinner, dad? Uh, we're having this. Well, I don't like it. Well, you've never had it before. How do you know you don't like it? The city connects are coming out tomorrow. I don't like them. I don't know what they are, but I don't like them. I guarantee I'm not going to like them because I don't want that nonsense. Uh, it's marketing. It's bullshit. I'm not a big baseball jersey guy. I'll wear soccer jerseys. I don't think I even have a single baseball jersey, but I'm definitely not buying the City Connect. Now, the hat, I'll say. Um, I don't like it. Uh, and, you know, finally, fuck the Mets. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, just fuck the Mets. When all, all probably, else fails. When all yeah. else fails. Yeah. I mean, they haven't won, and that has made my week a little bit better. And I appreciate yeah. that. So when in doubt, fuck the Mets. Yeah, exactly. Well, I appreciate you guys. Just remember everybody out there, check out Pensive Technology. If uh, you have any of those sound or security or TV installation needs, hey, we're all still drinking Philly Standard. Um, check it out. Whenever Schwarbs hits a home run, go on their app and uh, go get a free beer. Um, little uh, tidbit of trivia. Uh, they ran out of Philly Standard. They had to make an emergency batch the other day, and I – think that's because of all you that listen to this podcast that's by the way has no basis in fact that's just mike's opinion uh remember to check out our facebook and hit the shop now button for some cool swag and may 18th um we have dpf night at citizens bag park go on the uh philly's pace website and put in dpf 2024 as your code trying to get to at least 500 tickets sold we're partnering with no fly zone in lot n um, that day, $50, all you can eat and drink $30, all you can eat, uh, for designated drivers. And remember our salute to service shirt. Um, Hey, fuck the Mets, fuck Joe Carter. And we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for joining us. See ya.